doing our best to settle in for the evening. <clears throat> if you haven't already, listen to the body, do whatever's helpful to support a stable, relatively comfortable posture. And as you know now, being in our third week, we have been doing this slow chanting of the three refuges, just as a beautiful ritual of singing together at the beginning of our class. But also it's traditionally a way of remembering our practice. We're valuing being awake, being open, open-hearted, that's Buddha. We're valuing connecting with the reality of the present moment being real about what's showing up. And in particular for this course, being real about what we're feeling, the underlying feeling that's here due to our bodily experience, due to our mental experience. This is Dhamma, taking refuge in Dhamma. And third, the third refuge we sing about is taking refuge in Sangha this beautiful way of responding that comes out of being intimate, comes out of Buddha being open to Dhamma the way it is. So let's do that now, chant this together, and then we'll go into our guided meditation. Settle in for the meditation time now. And we'll begin with some simple body scans. So let's start by simply meeting the experience of the sitting body, greeting this old friend, 
this great ocean of bodily sensations coming and going. And those of you who took the winter course, one of the things we practice was being aware of the elements of the sensation, the earth elements, the fire or temperature elements, heat and coolness, the air element or the wind element, which is the pushing or motion that we might feel in the body. And then the traditional term is the water element, that cohesive fluid feeling that we can sense more subtle than the other elements. But with our study of feeling tone, we're still, of course, going to be aware of these specific changing flow of sensation, the hardness, the softness, the heat, the coolness, the stillness in the body, the movement in the body, the cohesive sense of the body. But in particular, we're interested in the effective tone of those sensations. Venerable Analio, this German monk, he uses the phrase, the push of feelings. So when we're feeling something pleasant, the warmth in the body is experienced as pleasant, for example. Something we're noticing the push that goes with the pleasantness. So let's start, well, do a simple body scan and we'll be particularly interested in any pleasant sensations that stand out. And notice that effective tone, that push with the pleasantness that is apparent to us. We don't have to force anything, we're simply curious. So we begin by feeling the head, the face, top of the head. And just opening to the flow. Now it's going to take some training because the habit might be to immediately pay attention to what's unpleasant. So if there is a pleasant feeling of coolness where the air is touching the skin of the head, the skin of the face, then be aware that that touch of the air is pleasant, known, seen as pleasant. And there's that impulse, that subtle push to want the pleasantness to last or continue. The mouth might be moist in a pleasant way. Feeling the neck, the shoulders, Feeling both arms, simply curious about pleasantness. And of course, it might be just subtly pleasant, not intensely pleasant, the sensations. 
For example, if your hands are touching the warmth of that touch, might in an ordinary, somewhat subtle way be pleasant. Just be curious about the pleasantness. And a lot of these ordinary sensations may seem somewhat between being neutral and pleasant, that's okay. When things are pleasant, there's this natural desire for things not to change because it's pleasant, it's fine. There's a contentment and a simple desire for this to continue, to not be disturbed. We feel the torso start at the upper chest and upper back, the rib cage. And be careful if there's a, an assertive thought, oh, there's nothing pleasant here. Of course, that thought might arise, that's okay. But it doesn't define the truth of the moment. Just let that thought come and go and continue to be interested as you simply open to the torso, little by little moving the attention down through the trunk of the body eventually coming to the mid spine, the kidney area, the solar plexus area. A deeper breath might feel pleasant. Notice the pleasantness. And you might even Greedily take another one, wanting it to feel as good as the first. Because of that push that arises with pleasant experience. We feel the lower back and the belly. And the structure of the pelvis, the groin, the sits bones. Simply curious about pleasantness, even ordinary or relatively subtle pleasantness arising because of sense contact, the sensations of the body in this case. And when you're ready, just down both legs. Just appreciating the sensations that are relatively pleasant. And sometimes we don't notice initially the pleasantness until we realize that the heart is content with the sensations in the legs. And then in a sense, we back up and we realize there's contentment because the sensations are pleasant in an ordinary way. both feet just as they are just notice any pleasantness and we're going to shift now beginning at the feet Curious about any subtle or not so subtle unpleasantness or pain. And we're looking at that space between the contact of the sensation, the sense contact, and any reactivity 
to the unpleasantness. And that space between those two is what we call the affective tone or feeling tone. So we feel our feet just as they are. Maybe there's a particular point where there's too much pressure. Or too much heat, too much coolness. So we feel the push of the feeling tone, the push into a, an emotion or a reaction. But before the reaction, there's just the feeling tone, that effective tone, which might lead to a not liking and an impulse to move the body, for example. And then move up into the legs, take your time. And from this place of balance and curiosity, we're just feeling the legs, interested in any ordinary unpleasantness. How does the mind know? What is it about this moment's experience that makes it clear that this sense contact is being known as unpleasant? As we feel the sensations in the legs. And that push into reactivity. And if we're aware of that push of feeling tone, then there's this choice not to have to fall into the reactivity or the mental proliferation about why my knee hurts. We can just be aware of the sense experience and that push of feeling tone. Feel the pelvis when you're ready in the lower part of the trunk, taking your time, just notice what's here and then curious in this balanced way, curious about any unpleasantness, any ordinary pain. And when we're aware of feeling tone, then all those tendencies to react or to think, to worry or whatever, they don't have to get activated. We could just be with the feeling tone without it leading onward to activation. And if the heart, the mind is already activated, there's already aversion then just trace back from the aversion to the feeling tone that's prompting the aversion or the fear or the reactivity. What's the feeling here? You can ask, what's the underlying feeling? We're feeling the whole trunk now, upper trunk, including the shoulders and both arms, both hands. Take your time though. Curious about any relatively obvious places of discomfort or pain.
for some, in some moments, it will be helpful to use a simple phrase to stabilize the present moment awareness, something like unpleasantness is like this. It's just this unpleasantness being known. Can this be okay? Just to be here with this painful feeling, unpleasant feeling. Yeah. Feeling the push, the impulse into action, but it doesn't have to, the action doesn't need to be carried out. It could just be felt for what it is. And the neck, the throat, and the entire head now. Curious about any unpleasantness. Any tension that stands out as being clearly unpleasant. And remember to distinguish as best you can between noticing reactivity, like getting tight around something that's unpleasant, or thinking about something, a place that's unpleasant, and tracing back to the underlying feeling tone itself. As I'm sure you're noticing, it's not the habit of the mind, of the wisdom in the mind, to be able to be interested in feeling tone. Or especially neutral feeling tone, which is what we'll pick up now. So we're still now at the head and the face, simply opening to the sensations as they are in an unforced way. So just relaxed and balanced, aware of the sensations in the head and the face. And now in particular interested in what would be considered by the mind, by the knowing mind, neither pleasant nor unpleasant. And of course, these are the sensations and the feeling tone that we or in the habit of ignoring precisely because it's neither pleasant nor unpleasant. So for example, the weight of the hair on the head, it's generally a neutral experience, not obviously pleasant or unpleasant. And there's even a push here with neutral experience and the push is toward ignoring it, leaving it alone, not reacting. It's not worthy of a reaction. So we just sense that push of ignoring or even the air touching the skin of the face might be for you neutral. Feeling the clothes touching the tops of the shoulders and around the neck and down the arms. That simple contact of the clothes, making contact with the skin. And we'll notice, of course, the 
strong tendency to want to pay attention to what's pleasant or unpleasant. So we really rely on a wholesome curiosity, almost like a wholesome challenge to be aware of what's neutral in both arms and the hands. like the temperature of the skin in places that are neutral, neither too hot nor too cold. And then exploring neutrality as we open to the different sensations in the trunk and the torso. Take your time. You might want to begin at the top and just slowly open the awareness down through the trunk. Interested in whatever is experienced as being neutral. Remember, this is quite fluid. So something might initially appear to be pleasant or unpleasant. And a moment later, his experience is being neutral and maybe changes again. That's okay. Because in the end, whatever the feeling tone that's being known, it's a construction of the mind anyway. But it's a very important construction to learn how to notice. So down into the lower part of the torso, the pelvis, sits bones, noticing neutrality, One thing that's often neutral or even sometimes pleasant is just the energetic or vibratory sensations in the body. Precisely the sensations that the mind is in the habit of ignoring because they're just neutral. Feeling both legs now. Curious about the neutrality of sensation here in the legs. And some of these sensations we might characterize as being nondescript, almost like nothing is there except we are feeling something but that just might be what neutral experience is like. Nothing clearly standing out because it's neutral. Not obviously pleasant, not obviously unpleasant. Including both feet. feeling the whole body. And let's just for another few minutes, stay interested in neutrality, feeling the whole body wherever the attention goes, curious about neutrality. Because we can uh, detect maybe a subtle and sometimes not so subtle addiction to what is intense dramatic, which usually means 
immediately paying attention to what stands out as being pleasant or unpleasant. And for the last few minutes now, feeling aware of the whole body. So we're mostly aware of sensations, but other present moment phenomena might arise like hearing or a thought or emotion. Just be curious about the feeling tone. What's the feeling here? What's the underlying feeling? And it's as if we're letting every feeling, the effective feeling, be a teacher. Can it be okay that it feels like this? So the feeling is a teacher teaching the heart to be not attached. Or it's okay that this feeling's here. This unpleasant feeling, this pleasant feeling this neutral feeling, allowing the feelings to come and go as they will. So let's just have a few minutes of silence now to explore this. And one thing that can begin to become clearer, which is really clearing up our understanding of what the path is all about, we'll notice in moments that it seems that what we're doing is managing our feeling, trying to get to more pleasant feeling and away from unpleasant feeling. Even when we're meditating, it can seem this way. And that obviously is not the path. That just leads to more of the same, more stress. And there'll be other moments when we're practicing formally or informally during the day. And it will seem that the practice isn't so much about managing the underlying feeling tone but being really curious about feeling tone and recognizing, at least in moments, a kind of freedom, not being pushed around by feeling tone, but just curious that it's pleasant now or it's unpleasant now and how that underlying feeling is always in motion, never fixed never really defining a me, defining my life. And just as a support for going forward in our course, getting right into the middle of our class, 
we can end the sit by just visioning, imagining ourselves having a, a radically new relationship with feeling, with pain and pleasure and neutrality, a relationship of curiosity and non-fear, not being driven or controlled by pleasure and pain. What would that be like? And we don't need to answer that question, but just be curious. So when you feel ready, just begin to move the body. Notice pleasure and pain as you do that and anything else. Great to be with everybody tonight. Thankful for the folks that sent in some questions. I'll try to weave maybe I think five or so folks sent in some comments and questions, what they've been learning. And it just uh, makes our Zoom world work a little better, this kind of interaction that we can have. Uh, people's comments and questions really speaking for, I'm sure a lot of the the group because we share this experience of having a mind <laughs> really is our uh, shared experience. And this point that I made at the end of the guided sit, it's I think really useful to carry forward, which is um, it's kind of a expression of our faith or confidence in these practices and teachings from the Buddha that we can turn any moment of experience, any moment of our life into the path, into the practice, which is um, what would non-attachment, non-grasping look like now? And even if I'm in a moment where I'm really freaking out and I have a full-blown emotional reaction to whatever just happened to me, somebody insulted me or whatever, Still, even with that emotional reactivity and the unpleasantness of that, well, what would non-grasping look like now? So it doesn't matter where we are, like what are the particulars of the experience, a really calm moment where we're feeling really a lot of pleasantness or really ordinary neutral moment or really intensely unpleasant moment. What would non-grasping, non-attachment look like here and now? And then that really helps us understand the central role of feeling tone, Vedana. And Vedana is this particular aspect of the present moment. And one way to understand it, you know, this is subtle. And, you know, there's what we call sense contact when we hear a sound, when the mind knows a thought, know that knows that a thought is arising or smells a smell or tastes a taste or feels a touch, hears a sound. So that sense contact, then the mind recognizes the experience based on past conditioning. Oh, that's the sound of a car. That's what we call perception. And right there with contact and perception, there's this affective tone feeling tone. This, as uh, Venerable Analio, this German monk, Buddhist monk, calls it a push of feeling. I like that. Because their feeling tone, even though it's, it's specifically a mental phenomena, it's kind of uh, related to the perception. I like that, <laughs> you know. So before the liking, there's a recognition with the perception. Ah, there's a push, which pushes the mind toward a reaction, if it's pleasant, holding on, getting more, if it's unpleasant, getting away from it, turning away from it, and if it's neutral, ignoring it, right? So they're the push before the reaction. So it's the space between the reaction, the emotional reaction, right? 
whatever the reaction might be, and the contact, that's the feeling tone, it's that bridge. And it's okay, because a lot of the time what we're gonna catch is the reaction. But then, you know, with curiosity, well, what's the mind reacting to? Oh, I don't like this. Oh, what is that experience of not liking? Oh, there's, it's unpleasant, right? It's that, that conclusion based on the contact and the perception, the recognition of the experience, there's this kind of conclusion. Now that conclusion will be different for every mind because we have different causes and conditions in forming. And it's even gonna be different for each of us at different times. Uh, somebody sent in an, an email about this. You know, it's like if, if my loving partner touches my hair in a soothing way, you know, I'll experience that as pleasant. If a stranger comes up and touches my hair, I'm gonna experience that as, you know, probably really unpleasant. Like, that's weird. What are you doing? <laughs> Get your hand off my head. You know, how dare you? So, uh, but then we get to know that person and then it's it maybe pleasant. Maybe our new honey. <laughs> so the, uh, the we're, it's not about <clears throat> wondering why something is pleasant or unpleasant or neutral. We just know that the pleasantness or unpleasantness or neutrality of any sense experience through any of the six sense gates, it is what it is. We know it's arising lawfully, but we won't know all the causes and conditions that are making this pleasant or unpleasant, but we will see how alive it is. And it's, you know, it's related to the contact, the direct experience, but it's also related to the mind that's knowing the particular quality of the mind that's knowing that sense experience, right? Because, you know, when I'm irritable, then things that I would normally consider to be neutral could be experiences unpleasant. So if I have a, a grumpy attitude, then that affects. Or if I'm in a cheerful mood, then things that would normally irritate me might be seen as neutral or even pleasant. Isn't that funny how that is? You know, we walk around the block and we're in a funk and just have nothing but complaints about what people are doing with their yard and how somebody is dressed and, you know, how somebody parked their car. And, and then the next day we walk around and we have a completely different attitude and we just, you know, things that we see the beauty in things and the, their experience is pleasant. So it's really important that we understand and appreciate the constructed nature a pleasant uh, of any <clears throat> feeling tone, because this is in the direction of uh, of understanding how to be free, how to be non-attached in a world with feeling tone, because it's precisely getting that it's constructed and it's in ephemeral. And this is one of the great things about even, you know, if we could sort of break into small groups right now and uh, check in with each other about our set where we were working mostly with physical sensations because it's <clears throat> relatively easy to study feeling tone based on the experience of physical sensation. I bet a lot of us noticed that like when I first paid attention to this physical, particular physical sensation, you know, oh yeah, it was clearly unpleasant. And then, it's like part of the ignorant mind, let's call it, wants to impose consistency. But after a while, the evidence just doesn't support that it's unpleasant. And so finally, we get straight with ourselves. No, it's not unpleasant. I don't know what it is, but it isn't unpleasant anymore. Like there isn't that push to make it go away, that push of the, fee the unpleasant feeling tone. It's just, sensation, is this neutral? Maybe this is neutral. And then because we might have, there might be like a lot of interest and a lot of balance and maybe even some kindness in terms of the attitude of the knowing mind. And so the whole experience of knowing that sensation because of the steadiness, the samadhi, 
is this pleasant? Right, because what makes the, the experience pleasant, unpleasant and neutral, it's dynamic. It's partly dependent on the contact, the perception, the mind that's knowing, the quality of the mind in the mind that's knowing. But we don't have to figure it all out. We just need to keep collecting data that feeling tone isn't fixed. And it doesn't refer back. It's a construction. And that construction is happening all the time. It's a dynamic construction. Because the more we see the ephemeral, constructed, changing nature of feeling tone, the less and less the heart is willing to let it drive the show. And, you know, one way to think of an ordinary human being, you know, or a worldly human being in, in how it's talked about in the early Buddhist tradition, you know, a worldly human being is somebody who hasn't trained uh, their mind, their heart, is that it's somebody who's, we're constantly being pushed around by feeling tone. And I, I think I mentioned last week and maybe even a couple of times about the big water buffalo with the ring in its nose and how even though the beast is so strong, it doesn't want to feel the tug on the nose. So it does whatever its master does, asks it to do because the little boy, the little girl, the person just tugs the rope this way and the bowl or whatever the big beast goes that way because it doesn't want to feel the unpleasantness of the tug. And we're the same way. I imagine chocolate. I feel the tug. I can't deny it, right? Like the unpleasantness of not having it, the pleasantness of the thought of having it. I'm under the spell. I'm that's what addiction is. We don't know how to be with the unpleasantness of not having the fix. We don't know what to do with the pleasantness of imagining having the fix. So we're enslaved, literally. The mind gets enslaved. It's true with our entertainments. It's tr true with, I mean, this is what we learn <clears throat> in the sitting po posture and why it's, we're so encouraged in terms of our sitting practice to gently, skillfully increase the time we sit. So it might start at 10 minutes. And then after some time, a few weeks, a few months, we might up it to 20 minutes and eventually to 30 minutes and maybe sometimes an hour sit even. And uh, the body gets stiff. Have you noticed? <laughs> and starts to feel uncomfortable the longer we sit. <clears throat> Knees hurt, back hurts. <clears throat> but it's so instructive because especially if we're with a group or we've, <clears throat> excuse me, made a commitment to ourselves. <clears throat> not to move. And uh, in some traditions, there are this, uh, there is this encouragement to have uh, a strong resolve to move, not to not to move for this, whatever period of time. And, um, and then we get to look at that, the pain and the impulse to move. And we can change our relationship to physical discomfort. Oh, like how there can be feeling tone. There can be like, we can't <clears throat> stop the contact. We cannot pay attention to it, right? So you can go into, if you have the skill, you can go into deep samadhi, deep concentration, where the mind has secluded itself, so turned so deeply within that even though the body still feels sensation, the knowing mind is choosing not to know that these sensations are showing up. But that's not always available. And that's not always the best place to learn. With a more ordinary level of concentration where there's some balance, some settledness, but the knee really hurts and the knowing mind knows the knee really hurts or the back really hurts, then we can really practice knowing the contact like the burning or the twisting or the pressure or whatever the particular sensations that are, you know, arising through the nervous system and being known by the knowing mind. And <clears throat> to some degree, the um, perception, like 
this is not okay, <laughs> you know, this is unpleasant. So that perception feeling tone and wisdom, the stability of present moment awareness and wisdom can know, oh yeah, it's like this. And it's such an interesting place like when the attention can be right there in the moment of the contact, perception, and the unpleasant feeling tone, unwavering presence, relaxed balance, we can tolerate so much discomfort. And it's in moments, not a problem. It doesn't mean the mind wisdom definitely knows this is unpleasant. So it's not like the mind's oblivious. The mind is very alert, very present, but it's not letting the push of the unpleasant feeling tone go to that emotional reaction, that overwhelm, that feeling cornered, that being oppressed by the unpleasantness, the mental proliferation, this is not okay, and there are another 29 minutes before my sit is over, and there's no way I can make it for 29 more minutes, And but if I move, people are gonna think I'm a bad meditator, and every one of those thoughts just sort of amplifies the discomfort. That's the second arrow that we talked about last week. So really look both with pleasant, and that's kind of our homework for next week is to emphasize the investigation with pleasantness. And then the following week, we'll really dig in more specifically with unpleasantness and then the following week neutrality. So for this next week in particular, get interested with pleasant. And even if you have to kind of uh, go out of your way to find it, oh, I know I like this food. I like this beverage. I like this experience. Ask your sweetheart if you have one or a good friend to touch your body in a way you like, a nice massage or whatever it might be. And... Uh, but just really get interested in the pleasantness of it. Or when you're eating something you like to eat, just slow it down a little bit and really notice the pleasantness of the sight, the pleasantness of the smell, the pleasantness of the anticipation. And you'll see that push of the, like really wanting it. Have you noticed like when we're eating something pleasure or pleasurable that we sort of speed up and the size of the spoon gets bigger and bigger, not the size of the spoon, but what's on the spoon gets more and more. And it's like, uh, because we don't know how to be with the pleasure without acting on the push. We're then basically what's born is the one who wants it. And this is all spelled out. Some of you took the Buddhist studies course on dependent co-arising. Right? And this is why feeling tone is so emphasized in the Buddhist teachings. And the beings that are fully awakened like a Buddha, they're described as people who aren't being pushed around by feeling tone. That's one of the operational definitions of an awakened being is somebody like us, a sensitive mind and body, right? a knowing mind that's sensitive to the body and sensitive to what the mind, what's going on in the mind, experiencing feeling tone, but not pushed around by it because it knows how to be aware of the push. Does it mean that a arahat, a fully awakened one, doesn't feel the push of pleasure, the push of unpleasantness and pain, the push of neutrality, push to ignore of neutrality, yeah, that because that the push of feeling is something that arises because of the past conditioning. So it's not going to change like it's going to express itself in every moment based on everything, all the past conditioning and the particular contact in the moment. But wisdom, we can train the mind so that there's wisdom there to meet the feeling tone that's arising. So what is that like? And it's interesting, especially this next week, if you really take up this homework and get interested in pleasant, pleasant experiences, pleasant sights, 
pleasant sounds, put on some nice music, but make it a practice. Pleasant taste, pleasant smells, pleasant thoughts, pleasant memories, right? So through any of the six sense gates and the more the merrier, right? And uh, because sometimes with pleasure, you know, we don't want to meet it with wisdom because we sort of think on a superficial level that reacting to pleasure makes it more pleasurable. Like I was saying, using the example, you know, eating ice cream or granola, you know, which is something I have, you know, with some frequency um, and I like, you know, and I put all kinds of stuff in the, the granola and yogurt or oat milk or whatever I use that I like, you know, so I dress it up just the way I like it. These kinds of nuts and these kinds of fruits and and uh, it's hard to, I find it like really difficult to be with the pleasure without rushing. And it's just so interesting because rushing doesn't make it more pleasurable. It actually, have, if we look, and this would be nice to confirm, and remember next week we'll have small groups. So one of uh, the possible themes that in the sharing in the small groups, and I'll just make a plug, please, plan to stay for the small groups. And if it's unpleasant for you to be in the small groups, well, then you know what to do. Oh, it's unpleasant. Unpleasantness is like this. And you'll feel the push to leave the Zoom room before the small groups begin, but you can just be with that unpleasantness, right? Just like the people who really love the small groups can be with the pleasure of it. But in any case, that would be a great thing to report on next week is like really investigating how we spoil, contaminate the ordinary pleasures that come our way in life by trying to hold on, by rushing it, having wanting more of it faster over and over and over and over. Everything from affectionate moments with a friend or a lover to like I mentioned around food. Or it's just interesting, like when we're walking in a place that's really pleasurable, it's interesting how hard it is to stay with it. But how easy it is for me to fantasize about having a cabin where this would be there, right? Which is basically being caught up in greed, which is stressful. That it's easy for me to proliferate, you know, for the entire walk about fantasizing about stuff in a stressful way, but to simply notice the sunshine or to notice, you know, other sort of ordinary pleasures of the sights and the bird sounds and happy people who are out there walking or whatever else that might be relatively pleasurable it's not so hard, it's not so easy rather for the mind to stay on that level of contact feeling. And I, I don't know if I mentioned this, but Joseph Goldstein, one of my important teachers, he would uh, mention like, you might even need to make that mental note. And he would combine those two words like contact. So there's a sight that's being seen. That's what contact means. Like it's, it's sort of a visceral word like, the photons are making contact with the eye or the sound vibrations are making contact with the ear or the thought is making contact with the knowing mind or the smell with the nose or the taste with the tongue or the touch with the skin, right? So there's contact, perception, the mind recognizes that there's contact and immediately right then and there is feeling. So to just contact feeling, and to kind of really, in a sense, own that, take responsibility for the contact feeling, because that is the basic definition of being alive. Contact feeling, contact feeling, contact feeling, contact feeling, contact feeling, ongoingly, never ending. And it's, and it's kind of overwhelming being a human being, a sensitive human being, which makes sense why we depend so much on distraction being lost in thought, because we haven't figured out how to be okay 
with the exposure of contact feeling, contact feeling, contact feeling. And so we very quickly go from a moment of contact feeling into mental proliferation around the liking of it or the not liking of it or looking for something more interesting or why is this happening to me or how can I have more of this? What's more interesting that I can pay attention to in this moment? And so the, as I mentioned after the guided set, so with our homework and <clears throat> conversation in the small groups next week, and of course, send me your questions and comments. Um, it's always nice to, I can't get too many because I won't be able to weave them in, but I can definitely work with a, a small handful of uh, comments and questions that are emerging. And uh, one of the things to look at is like, what would it mean to be somebody who is living a life where I am exposed to pleasure? What would, what's it like to be exposed to pleasure and to realize a non-attachment to pleasure, which means actually not attachment means being more intimate with the pleasure because the reaction to pleasure, the attachment to pleasure actually ends up distancing the heart from the pleasure that is actually available in life. Because I'm busy trying to put the granola down my mouth, I'm not really there with the crunchiness, the nuttiness, the fruitiness, the sweetness of the experience, right? Because I'm in, entangled in the greed, which is stressful. And I'm so lost in that experience, obviously that I'm not aware that it's stressful, at least in most of the moments. Because if we were aware, I would stop <laughs> and I'd slow down and I'd be more at the experience of contact pleasure. Pleasant feeling tone, but I'm not. So uh, I th think I've mentioned this maybe the first day, but uh, this is a really great uh, text, not just for the uh, winter course that we finished, the spring course that we're in the middle of on feeling tone, and the summer course, which will be on mindfulness of the mind, and the fall course will be mindfulness of dhammas, is this book by um, Venerable Analio, this German monk I've already mentioned. And he's written three books actually on Satipatthana. It, what's so great is there, it's, it's just like his own learning. And so he felt like he had to write it again <laughs> and then again. So the first one was his, uh, based on his dissertation. Um, he went to like a Buddhist university in Sri Lanka, even though he's a Westerner or a German person. Um, and then uh, he wrote another one where he looked at the teachings on Satipatthana. Satipatthana just means the foundations of mindfulness. And the second text he wrote really was about how uh, he, he compared what was in the early Tibetan texts and the early Chinese texts with, with what's in the early Pali texts. So these are the three ancient lineages of Buddhism. And the later traditions, the Tibetan tradition, Chinese tradition, embedded in their texts are the Pali texts. But the transmission happened, of course, long ago. And it just helped him, just that academic analysis helped him get a little closer to maybe what the Buddha was actually saying by comparing the three texts. That was the second. And then this book, the one that I'm recommending, Satipatthana Meditation, a practice guide, is a more a book more for practitioners, and it's his more most recent book. And I just want to read a little bit from this. This is um, on page 106 and 107. And he's really just talking about something similar to what we did. And um, one of the resources I sent out in the email is his guided meditation on feeling tone that you can use if you want that support. And he writes here, after having done such scanning, we remain aware of the whole body in the sitting posture. So 
down, interested in pleasure, pleasant feeling tone, coming up through the body, looking unpleasant feeling tone, down, neutral, and then just whole body awareness. Now, of course, thoughts will intrude and sounds might intrude in your sense. And you just look at the feeling tone of whatever phenomena is being known. But when the other sense gates aren't dominating, just stay with the sensations in the body as your primary training ground. That's really what he's saying. We just keep noticing its effective tone, he writes. Having explored the manifestation of feeling in and on the body, we continue by opening up to the opening up the vista of our awareness by noticing any type of feelings, even those that do not have a prominent impact on the somatic level. Hearing a sound, for example, we might note the effective tone that accompanies our recognition and mental processing of that sound. The same goes for the other senses. In this way, we learn to be continuously aware of the effective dimension of our experience. Moreover, we come to distinguish more clearly if a particular feeling started on the bodily level or because of mental evaluation. Contemplation of feeling can become a powerful tool for shining the light of awareness on mental events. This potential lies in the relative simplicity of the effective tone of feelings compared to the comparatively more complex character of other aspects of mental activity. So that's, you know, and we've all kind of learned this, like if you really want to get to know the mind, one of the reasons the body emphasize, or the Buddha rather, emphasizes mindfulness of the body, it's a really useful vehicle to get to know the mind because the body expresses the mind in a very clear way, some of the time at least. And feeling tone especially is that bridge between body and mind. Let me just read a little bit more here. Trying to remain aware why the mind is engaged in some thought activity is more easily said than done. As thought easily draws us in and soon enough we find ourselves immersed in the thinking rather than watching it. Yet Satipatthana meditation is not something to be carried out only in the absence of thought. On the contrary, it needs to be, it needs to encompass all possible situations, be this in formal practice or when moving out into the world. Unless we learn in some way to remain mindful while the mind is active, how will we ever be able to carry our mindfulness practice along into daily life? Therefore, finding a way of learning to be mindful when the mind is engaged in thought is an important requirement. Here, feelings offer convenient training ground. Due to their simplicity, feelings are somewhat like a handle that we can use to take hold of the complexity of mental events without getting caught up in them. In this way, when the mind is involved in thinking, perhaps even in emotional reactions, this need not be considered an obstruction to practice. Instead, it can become an opportunity to train ourselves in the skill of considerable importance. This is the ability to remain aware of the basic affective tone of the present moment experience. Such tuning in on the affective level provides a grounding. It can serve as an anchor that prevents our being carried away by what, it, by what is taking place. So I find this really useful and a lot of you know this, this asking, well, what's the feeling here? You know, and we can do this sporadically all day long. What's the underlying feeling? What am I feeling? What's the heart feeling? And it, it's such a powerful grounding to be interested in the underlying feeling. Uh, it's page 106 and 107 I've been reading from. So let me just ask that. So again, for homework then, that general question, what's the feeling here? What am I feeling? Pleasant, unpleasant. And remember, if you can't answer pleasant, unpleasant, ah, neutral. 
Or if you don't like that word neutral, if that's a little weird, say it's neither obviously pleasant, nor is it obviously unpleasant right now, whatever is predominant, whatever I'm experiencing. Okay. And then you can look for that push towards ignoring or with neutrality. If you don't like that push towards ignoring, it's the push towards something exciting, right? And for some of us, you know, more aversive types, we're on the lookout for like what I can complain about. <laughs> what is what is it that I don't like? Or if you're more of a greed type, looking, tuning into what's pleasure, pleasurable. And uh, a little later in that chapter, a couple of pages down, um, Venerable Analio talks about, you know, and this is especially true with really strong, painful experiences. It's not like we're torturing ourselves by just, in a sense, staring or keeping in mind excruciating pain or what's really unpleasant. We just need, we, we want to have that experience where we're aware of the contact we're aware, like in this case, of something that's intensely unpleasant or intensely pleasurable. And just to have a moment of that freedom where we're just there, we realize it's a, it's a realization. It's like you know, a little insight, a little moment of awakening that the stability of present moment awareness can just be at that level of contact feeling tone. And there's the freedom that's realized in that moment is the freedom of the mind not being pushed into reactivity. And that freedom of not being pushed into reactivity requires that we we'll really learn how to be present with the push. Because if we're not able to meet the push, be aware of the push, we're going to go right to the reactivity. What in the reactivity could be denial or ignoring, it could be fantasizing, or it could be, you know, some act of struggle to get more of what we like or to get away from what we don't like. So let me read this first question that came in. <clears throat> um, the person writes, as I practiced this last week, I've noticed something that leaves me a little confused. The feeling tone of a sense contact seems to be extremely context dependent. Absolutely right. The same bird song that seems to have a pleasant feeling tone when I'm sitting with my morning coffee may elicit an unpleasant tone when I'm trying to sleep late. Or if my wife runs her fingers, this is the example I use through my hair, the feeling tone is pleasant. But if I run my own fingers through my hair, it's rather neutral. And if a stranger on a bus does it, well, it hasn't happened, but you see where I'm going. So, number one, maybe this is not really feeling tone, but it's something further down the processing line. And I need to look more closely to perceive Vedana the instant it arises. Well, this is the trouble with const a constructed experience. You know, we're looking for an absolute truth, but what we always find is a conditional phenomenon. And because conditions, the conditional nature of experience is a dynamic, it's a changing process. Feeling tone is alive with that change. But, but the difficulty of that, because the habit of like wanting something definitive, see, that's the point. Seeing that feeling tone isn't definitive is exactly what is exactly the insight we're cultivating because it changes. Because, you know, when we're experiencing from a kind of an ordinary uh, degree of awareness and wisdom, we experience something pleasurable. We mistakenly think that somebody, me, is because it's pleasurable it's worth grasping because the pleasure I'm deriving from this experience, this nice massage or this nice music I'm listening to means something substantial and lasting to me. Now we don't, we know if someone points this out to us that it's not 
actually substantial. But the delusion in the moment when we're experiencing something pleasurable is that this is worthy of reactivity. The activity of grasping it, of holding it, of imagining it's really gonna make a difference, right? Why else would I rush eating my granola, right? In a deluded way, the mind thinks that by grasping, attached, being attached to the pleasure that somehow Mark in some meaningful way is getting protected, is getting something he wants and will always have. It's all delusion, of course, but there it is. That's what, and it all is based on the not seeing feeling tone for what it is. This thing that I think this person is really discovering in the practice. And it's, it can like it is for this person, it can bring up some doubt, like, is this really feeling tone? Cause it doesn't seem like much. That's the point, <laughs> right? It isn't what it, we imagine it to be. Even really strong pain isn't what we imagine it to be. And the first thing, the first chip that we need, you know, that kind of begins to change is like we need some humility around feeling tone, pleasure and pain. Because we are pretty, by habit, pretty arrogantly certain when we're in the vicinity of something pleasurable that it really matters. Don't you mess with my bath. You know, like if you're someone who likes to have a really nice bath or I... There's kind of a joke when people get to go on retreat, uh, teach a retreat with Joseph Goldstein. I've heard people say this. He did do it when I taught with him once, but people have mentioned this, like he'll say to the newer teachers, because he often will have newer uh, residential retreat teachers get to teach with them just as a kind of a training. And uh, he'll say something like, um, you know, do this, do that, you know, just giving good advice. And then something as a joke, and don't interrupt my afternoon nap. <laughs> and uh, it's sort of this thing like the pleasure of my afternoon nap or the pleasure of my evening bath or my favorite cup of tea, because we somehow think that that pleasure, if I don't have it, that's not okay. And it's this misunderstanding of what the feeling tone is. The second question or comment, maybe this really is feeling tone and I'm learning that Vedana feeling tone is partly conditional upon the recent history and other perceptions I bring or find in the moment. Yeah, that's the thing. And here's the real trippy thing about feeling tone. It can change in a moment because we might initially be aware of the feeling tone without much wisdom and then as we begin to suffer because of the ignorant awareness of the feeling tone, that suffering may trigger wisdom to come in, right? Because often the cause for wisdom to arise in the mind is my heart starts to get squeezed by the attachment and then wisdom gets curious. Why am I hurting? <laughs> Why is this moment so unpleasant? Oh, there's this feeling tone. And then all of a sudden, what was suffering isn't suffering anymore. What was heavy isn't heavy anymore. And the last person, last point here, maybe whether it's Vedana or not is beside the point. The important issue is just to pay attention to what's going on in the mind and see how things seem to work. Yeah, and that's like a feeling tone is often, or at least Venerable Analio uses the term affective tone. And that word affect, right, affective, it really talks about uh, this sort of setting reactivity, emotion in motion. And what is it that sets it in motion? It's that push. And I think that's the interesting thing. We can help to be triggered or activated but we can relate to the activation with or without wisdom. Yeah, we can relate to the activation with or without wisdom. And that's really what we're learning in this class. What is it to be relating to relate to activation with wisdom?
I think about, um, you know, in, in therapeutic circles, people might practice, be encouraged to practice a, a kind of desensitization, like if they're, someone's afraid of heights or whatever, dogs, and they might, you know, little by little be around a dog or be in some high place. And, you know, just enough. So the unpleasantness is there, but workable, right? That's the process. And what do they do? They try to stay at the level of contact feeling tone, where they feel the push, but they realize with that wisdom awareness, oh, there is this unpleasantness, or there is this, like with addiction too, it's just this. So when we feel the tug, to eat more than we need to eat because it's there in the fridge or to watch more TV than maybe is healthy for us to watch or whatever the tug towards pleasantness might be that we'll be exploring this week. Just see if you can be with the, the pleasantness of the anticipation of gratification just to feel the excitement and the pleasure of the excitement without going into the reaction of getting it. And then you can look for other pleasures that are already here and notice that. And we're really learning to feed not on the intensity of getting rid of what we don't like ignoring what is neutral and getting what we do like, we can start to, in a sense, orient around the freedom. It's a kind of unworldly pleasure of not being pushed around, like the equanimity of non-attachment, of not being confused by feeling tone. This is from one of Venable and Nalio's earlier books uh, where he did that sort of analysis between the Tibetan, the Chinese and the Pali books that I, um, text that I mentioned. And at the end of this section on feeling tone, he writes, contemplation of feeling requires recognizing the effective tone of present moment experience. This effective tone is the conditioned product of contact and in turn forms the condition for ignorant reactions to feelings by way of craving and clinging. Contemplation of feeling thus enables one to become aware of the conditioned genesis of dukkha, of suffering, right in the present moment. Feelings are like uninvited guests. By not reacting to them, one can avoid being shot by the second arrow because right? these uninvited guests, they're going to keep showing up. But we can learn to not be surprised by all the uninvited guests that just come because of contact. We're sensitive through these six sense gates, thinking or mental activity in the five senses, constantly having uninvited guests, contact, feeling, tone. But we can learn, train the mind to be attentive and um, like I mentioned, we're just getting to know the push and making peace with the push. Oh, of course there's a push. I, I know there's a chocolate egg in my cupboard, right? I know it would be pleasant to put in my mouth, but I don't have to, because I know what that feels like. The stress of not having it, the pleasure of thinking about having it. I know how to be with and that's a mental contact, right? I'm imagining and it has a pleasant or unpleasant feeling tone, depending if I'm imagining not going and getting it or I'm imagining going and getting it. And we can just flip back and forth. And it quite literally drives us crazy a lot of the time, these imaginings.
Some of you remember in that dependent arising, the uh, dependent co-arising class, you know, it's feeling tone. When that's experienced without wisdom, there will be that craving, that identification with the push. So there's push and then the mind claiming it as me. I want that. I'll be happy if I have it. That's the craving. When we act on the craving, when I start to do something about the craving, then we call it grasping. We've created some karma, right? The, the craving is there and we're doing something about the craving. That's grasping. Then we become the person who's done something. We've somebody with karma and we're born as that person, right? The next mind moment, I'm different because I had the craving, I acted on the craving, I became the person who acted on the craving, I've taken birth in a sense in the next moment as somebody with the suffering, the grip of that acting it out, right? And I've reinforced the ignorance of acting on feeling tone as if it's more substantial than it actually is as if it actually feeds or kills me, a person, in some kind of meaningful way. And that's why we break that pattern. The, the teaching on dependent core rising, if you didn't take the class, it's the Buddha's way of describing how it is that suffering, the appearance of somebody suffering arises when it's all in personal nature happening. And so there is this conditional process. And one of the linchpins is the misunderstanding of feeling tone. So when there's wisdom meeting feeling tone, well, this is kind of like an extra credit question. Well, what happens when there is that stability of wise presence, aware that this pleasant feeling tone is there? What's the experience? Might it be the unpleasant neutral experience of equanimity or the unpleasant pleasure, I'm sorry, the unworldly pleasure of letting go, the unworldly neutral experience of balance, or even the unworldly unpleasantness of regret of having not learned our lesson earlier. So you might have noticed there in the teachings, if you've done some of the reading, there are this, these category of unworldly pleasure, unworldly pain, unworldly neutrality. But this is feeling that doesn't lead, doesn't trigger grasping. Like to have a wholesome regret of, of um, having missed my opportunity to practice, that doesn't lead to grasping, that leads to sort of being more awake, not wanting to miss it. Or unworldly pleasure is the kind of pleasure that doesn't lead to grasping, but leads to letting go. Like when you're concentrating, doing a, a, having a nice sit, and you're starting to feel the pleasure of calm, if you're a well-trained meditator, you don't grasp at the pleasure of being calm because that makes it go away. What do you do when you're feeling really settled? You abide in the pleasure. You don't grasp it because wanting to get concentrated is not the way to get concentrated. It's the way to get stressed. <laughs> the way to get concentrated is to allow the natural process of settling to happen. So we abide in the pleasure of concentration, we don't grasp it. So the, when we relate to when the pleasure, pain and neutrality is in the service of letting go, the, in Buddhism, we call that unworldly pleasure, unworldly pain and unworldly neutrality. So that's what I wanted to cover tonight. There's some more questions that people sent in and I'll uh, try to get to those next week. Really nice to be with everyone. You heard your homework. <laughs>
please consider doing it. Remember, um, there's a day long retreat this Saturday and the theme will be uh, mindfulness of feeling tone. So please join in if you have some time, 9.30 to four this coming Saturday. The following Saturday, there will be a half day retreat. And then in a few weeks on April 10th on Saturday, Mesky, State, uh, Mesky, Shelley, and I are going to be teaching a day-long workshop um, relating wisely to the sensual world. And it actually will be uh, related to some of what we're learning in this course. So please join in if you'd like for that. Take care, everybody. Have a good week.